All right, let's go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's program about the successful recovery of the Penobscot River. I hope that you and your families are safe and healthy during this COVID-19 pandemic that we're all living through. We would have loved to have been with you in person today for this presentation, but we appreciate you adapting with us and joining us online instead. My name is Todd Martin. I'm the Grassroots Outreach Coordinator at the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Uh, we're here today to celebrate the inspiring recovery of the Penobscot River after the removal of two dams and the construction of a stream-like bypass just north of Bangor. The effort was led by a coalition called the Penobscot River Restoration Trust. The trust is a nonprofit organization consisting of the Penobscot Indian Nation, American Rivers, Atlantic Salmon Federation, Maine Audubon, the Natural Resources Council of Maine, the Nature Conservancy, and Trout Unlimited. And today we're joined by representatives from many of those organizations. Um, today's panel includes John Banks, who's the director of the Department of Natural Resources for the Penobscot Indian Nation. Laura Rose Day, the CEO of the Seven Lakes Alliance in the Belgrade Lakes area. Kate Dempsey, the state director for the Nature Conservancy in Maine. Pete Didesheim, advocacy director at the Natural Resources Council of Maine and Andy Good, the Vice President of U.S. Programs for the Atlantic Salmon Federation. Uh, many of the stories that you'll hear today from our panelists are captured in a new book called From the Mountains to the Sea, edited by Peter Taylor. Uh, the book is available to order uh, for pre-order right now from Island Port Press, and the book will be uh, shipped out starting on December 11th. So I'm gonna drop a link in the chat right now for where you can pre-order this excellent book. And again, it'll start to be uh, shipped out uh, on December 11th. So I'm gonna, drop a, I'm gonna drop the link in the chat right now, a second here. So there's the link, hope you uh, pick up the book and, and enjoy it. So before we get started with our program, uh, a few notes about the Zoom technology that we're using this afternoon. So today's webinar is being recorded and on Thursday, you'll receive a link to uh, watch the recording. Uh, and we hope that you'll share the recording of this program with friends and family. Uh, your video and your audio is disabled today by design. Um, you'll only be able to see and hear our panelists um, who uh, we'll get started with shortly. If you have a question during the program, please type that question in the Q&A box. And the Q&A box can be found on the lower uh, ribbon uh, of your Zoom screen. And we're gonna answer uh, questions from the audience throughout the program. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Laura Rose Day, the CEO of the Seven Lakes Alliance, um, who will give us an overview of the Penobscot River Restoration Project. Take it away, Laura. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here today and to share with you uh, the the overview of how the Penobscot project came to be. It was uh, uh, really an honor to be part of it. And uh, thanks um, for uh, having me back to uh, reminisce a bit about this uh, really uh, fantastic um, project. And I've enjoyed watching um, uh, it evolve as time has gone on. So the Penobscot um, project is obviously about the Penobscot River. This is that you're seeing the headwaters of the Penobscot River. And um, one of the remarkable things about the project was its scale. And uh, next slide. Again, a picture of the headwaters. And you can see in the right hand box um, the uh, relative significance of the size of the Penobscot watershed to the state of Maine. And uh, as you can see, it's sort of right, right in, the, in the heart of Maine. Next slide flows uh, down through Howland and uh, Indian Island, um, VZ, Bangor to the Gulf of Maine and uh, fed historically a rich uh, fishery um, in, in this uh, near shore area. Next. This is what the river looked like before um, it was uh, harnessed for, for hydropower and the building of cities and to drive uh, industry. And it supported uh, life ranging from the insects on the bottom of the river, which uh, fed uh, songbirds, 
Next slide. And it was full of river herring, uh, which are the, the, the basis of the food chain, uh, not just in the Penobscot, but in all of the major rivers in Maine. And these are alewives migrating upstream. And as you can see from the photo, uh, they're persistent creatures. And uh, this story uh, will um, demonstrate why that's so important. Next slide. Um, in addition to fish, uh, the fish fed an entire ecosystem, ospreys and heron. Next slide. And the majestic Atlantic salmon. Uh, this is a sea run fish. Uh, um, Andy will talk about this a little bit more later, but um, the, there used to be uh, tremendous numbers of Atlantic salmon in the, in the Penobscot uh, River. Next slide. Sturgeon, short nose sturgeon. Atlantic sturgeon. Next slide. And people, and including uh, the indigenous people of this region, the Penobscot Nation. And uh, I'm I'm going to, of course, John's going to talk with you about about um, the connection of the Penobscot people to the region. But over time, the river was industrialized with factories and towns. It became a place where um, sewage was put into the river and uh, it was harnessed for hydroelectric power. Next slide. So these are the dams that blocked uh, migration of these fish from the headwaters, which we saw in the beginning, to the sea and back again. And without that free passage, uh, none of these fish, frankly, could survive. And they went from um, numbering um, in the in the you know billions of young fish and uh, hundreds of thousands of adult uh, salmon and other other species uh, to uh, barely hanging on because they could not pass up and down stream um, anymore to their habitat and without the ability to spawn uh, of course uh, the, these species would not survive and and with them we lost all of the things that uh, that we human communities uh, relied on them for. Next slide. So to address um, this problem um, of needing to have our, our fisheries back, uh, a number of uh, different organizations got together. Uh, you heard the members of the Penobscot Trust but um, there had been a, a pretty significant battle over relicensing these dams when that time came. And uh, long story short is that neither the hydropower companies um, nor those seeking to bring back uh, the life that inhabited the river uh, really got what they um, needed to get out of those, out of those proceedings. Uh, the hydropower company had wanted new, um, um, uh, a new dam and uh, there had been a, a quest for fish passage so that those fish could survive and fuel the entire ecosystem. And none of those things were really achieved. So um, in the wake of, of you know, a, a couple of decades of battles over that, um, these organizations and uh, the federal government and uh, the state got together and decided to come up um, with a better plan. Next slide. And this was the plan, a, um, an approach to both, um, to basically rebalancing the entire system. And that's an advantage that working at a large scale from the mouth of the ocean up uh, into the, north, into the, the, the headwaters um, had. We could take the entire system, look at the pieces and ask ourselves, if we had this to do anew today, what would we do? We would allow the fish to pass upstream and downstream, and we would also maintain energy and all of the economic benefits that flow from the river. So the plan that was agreed to um, was to um, purchase and remove two lower dams, the, the, the dam at the mouth of the river, Vesey and Great Works, and that would open up the entire lower river to, to most of the species that would have migrated up to that point install a new fish, lit, fish passage at the Milford Dam, which would allow all of the leaping species that would have gone far upriver to pass uh, upstream and then um, also uh, back downstream. And then uh, at the top of your screen at the Howland Dam, 
uh, to install a nature-like bypass. And that's basically an engineered um, uh, fish passage around uh, the dam that would allow fish to pass freely as if uh, the dam um, was not in place or as close to it as possible. And all, all together, that would uh, increase about 2,000 uh, miles of historic habitat. Uh, and, and that is um, uh, obviously an incredibly significant uh, achievement. And what's more remarkable really is that we were, because of this particular situation on the Penobscot River, able to um, increase, when I say we, the power company that retained uh, uh, a number of dams to increase power at those dams, either by increasing um, the pond level above some dams or uh, increasing generation at the remaining dams to maintain and even um, increase the power production. So in that way, the system was rebalanced so that we could in some ways um, have the, the best of, of both worlds. It, some energy production still, um, no lost energy and uh, fish passage. Next slide. After the dams were removed, the river was restored from flat impoundments uh, with um, uh, little oxygen and little fish, uh, very little fish passage to free flowing river. This was above the Great Works Dam. Next slide. This is a before and after of what had been the first dam on the river, the VZ Dam. So the top uh, photo is the dam before removal, obviously, and below you see what the river uh, looks like today uh, with a free flowing passage for, for, for salmon and other sea run fish and uh, a town park uh, that you can see on the left hand, hand side. Next slide. This, is, uh, this demonstrates the um, before and after fish, fish passage. So you can see on the left hand side, very limited fish passage uh, before the dams uh, were removed and the river um, reopened. And on the right hand side, 2000 miles of, of, uh, stream, um, of uh, streams and river that um, these species could enter. And uh, as you'll hear in a few moments, this has been really a remarkable success. Next slide. There um, are few uh, benefits of this project that are more profound uh, than the benefits and um, the restoration um, uh, for the Penobscot Indian Nation. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over uh, to my dear friend, John, um, to talk with you about that. John. Yeah, uh, thank you, Laura. Forgot to mention at the beginning here that Laura was actually the executive director of the Penobscot River Restoration Trust. And she was the, uh, the person that was on the ground every day uh, during the entire 15 years of this project and really kept us all going in the right direction. And uh, without her constant involvement, uh, I don't think this project would have happened the way it did. So to the Penobscot Nation, uh, there are, this is by far the most important conservation project that the tribe's been involved with in recent times. You know, we have a long history of uh, advocating for ecological improvements in this watershed. Um, it goes back to the Industrial Revolution where uh, the history tells us that tribal members traveled, tribal leaders that is, uh, traveled by birch bark canoe to meet with the colonial government to protest the first building of the dams down uh, in Southern Maine on the Presumpscot. So uh, when people ask me, when, when did this project begin uh, for the tribe, it began in the 18, early 1800s with the industrial revolution. And we've been involved with that, uh, you know, these issues for such a long period of time in recognition of uh, the benefits that the Penobscot watershed has uh, accrued to the, to the tribe. Uh, for thousands of years, the watershed provided all of our means of survival. Uh, it was our highway. Uh, to get to wherever we needed to get to, to gather the daily uh, necessities, uh, food, shelter, and medicine, and to be able to carry on commerce with neighboring tribes. 
Uh, so, you know, we talk a lot about um, uh, sustenance fishing rights uh, and how important those are. In every treaty that the tribe has ever entered into, we've reserved our sustenance fishing rights. That's a, a legal term of art. Uh, and I just wanna say uh, a little bit of clarification or difference between sustenance and subsistence. Uh, subsistence refers more to just uh, obtaining protein, uh, you know, through the harvesting of fish and wildlife and plants, but we talk about sustenance and the, uh, the root of that word is sustain. And so, you know, the tribe uh, believes that uh, when we talk about sustenance, it brings in our inherent stewardship responsibilities that we've had for this watershed uh, since time immemorial. So we all, you know, we talk about the three R's, respect, responsibility, and reciprocity. Well, the Penobscot River Restoration Project is a, a huge opportunity for the tribe to exercise its inherent stewardship responsibilities. We believe we have a reciprocal uh, duty to the natural world since it has provided for our sustenance for such a long period of time. So that's, you know, that's a big reason why this project was so important to the Penobscot Nation. Um, so I'm going to just kind of close here and make sure we have lots of, lots of time for uh, question and answers. But I just wanted to express a personal feeling uh, that I have when, you know, recently somebody asked me to talk a little bit about what comes to mind when I think of sense of place. And what came to me was the word home. You know, when, when we're in our homes, we have a feeling of security uh, because we know where everything is. We know where the peanut butter is, which cupboard it's in. And, you know, you go to somebody else's house to visit and maybe eventually you'll have to ask them where their bathroom is or where they keep their peanut butter. Uh, so when I'm out, you know, on the, the river paddling around or out in the woods gathering materials, it's a sense of security. It feels like home. And it reminds me of uh, Henry David Thoreau's, one of his trips and the conversation that he had with his Penobscot guide uh, when they were returning back to Indian Island paddling down the river, Thoreau asked his guide, he said, uh, isn't it going to be nice to finally be home after these, you know, this long trip? And Joe Paulus's response was that he had been home the entire time of the trip. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kate Dempsey. And again, thank you all for taking the time to be with us today on this beautiful day. Thanks so much, John and Laura. Um, Again, I'm Kate Dempsey, the director at the Nature Conservancy here in Maine. But at this moment in time, uh, John, hearing that story of, uh, of home and looking at all of you on my little Hollywood squares, in some ways I feel like this is old home, home day. And it's just so fantastic to see uh, really my co our colleagues we were colleagues together in this partnership and Todd mentioned some of the other partners um, who were part of the project making it successful. And um, it's just, as we say here in Maine, right? It's wicked fun to see you all. I wish we were all doing this. We had planned a phenomenal book announcement on the banks of uh, the river at Indian Island, but unfortunately COVID um, has us doing this, but I'm glad we're together. And so wonderful to see so many of our supporters who helped this project come to reality um, in the audience, at least on the participant list. So um, I wanna just pick up where John left off is maybe 
kind of a quick lightning round of a favorite story. This was a 16 year project from start of negotiations that Laura, John, Pete, Andy were involved in and many others. And then there was the more public facing, what, 12 years or so of that. Um, is there one moment, Pete, why don't we start with you? And I think I may have lost Andy. I don't know if he's here, but um, we'll keep going until Andy reappears. Um, so Pete, why don't you start with a quick, just memory of a favorite moment to get the kind of storytelling going. Okay, sure. And let me just share what um, Laura said, that it was an honor to be part of this project. And um, it, uh, for Natural Resources Council of Maine, this was really a meaningful experience to uh, be part of a collective effort to restore uh, fish passage to this great river uh, that suffered so much damage over the years. Um, so this is, you know, Maine has many good news stories over the years to repair damage to our environment. This really is one of our best stories. This is an incredible story. Every aspect of, of what we pulled off um, deserves a, a telling. And I'll put in a pitch for the book because I looked at the book uh, over the last couple of days. It's a great book and it captures a lot of stories. But let me just mention one story that's not in the book. Um, and it happened at the um, June 2016 a uh, ceremony for the nature-like bypass that Laura described at Howland. And it was a windy day and, and there was a lot of us huddled under a tent and we were, you know, waiting for the, the talking heads to, to share what a wonderful celebration this was. And, and I was sitting next to, next to Bucky Owens and uh, he's been a champion for Maine's rivers and fish restoration for 40 years of career at University of Maine and, and uh, the Department of Inland Fish and Wildlife Fabulous. I don't, I don't know if Bucky you're on here or not, but if you're watching, thank you for all that you've done for Maine's rivers. So I was sitting next to Bucky and we're talking about this incredible journey that we've been through together to get to this final celebration for the last big piece of this puzzle. And he tells me that the Department of Marine Resources had just detected the first tagged salmon heading up the Howland Bypass that morning. Um, it had been tagged at the Milford Fish Lift and it was traveling where no salmon had traveled in a way that no salmon had traveled in 180 years since the two lower dams had been removed and this, and this nature-like bypass had been opened up. And that fish, of course, was oblivious to all of us <laughs> under that tent, uh, celebrating this moment. Um, but we were collectively cheering for that fish and it left me thinking about the 10,000 years of the Penobscots in that river. And it left me thinking about the journey that all of us had been through to get to this moment where multiple challenges like that fish's effort to go kind of opposite from the title of the book from, from um, mountain to the sea, it was going from the sea to the mountains. And, uh, and all the obstacles, the boulders, the, the swim arounds, the challenges, had made it to this moment and that fish swimming up was that moment that crystallized for me, we did it. We actually did this. And I just wanna thank everybody that's been part of this project. It was really a good news story and the good news just keeps happening. Awesome, thanks Pete. And I wanna uh, remind our audience to go ahead and put questions in the Q&A and I'll be helping our team here monitor those. Um, but Andy, is there a story you'd like to share that speaks to your memory of the, in your, come off mute, you were about to do so. Okay. There you go. You're, well, sure. I mean, uh, you know, it's, there are a lot of milestones where I should, should have been able to relax during this project, but we, <laughs> we passed one, we were worried about the next but. I just want to, you know, say a couple quick things. You know, Scott Hall, who was the president of PPL Maine, was sort of critical to helping us uh, um, being a part of putting this deal together. And, you know, at an early meeting, I think it was in the year 2000, at one of the meetings, he said, you know, we're just willing, you know, we want to find a balance on the river. And this river had always been managed as an industrial river. We had never heard those words before. And that's really what all we were looking for. We weren't looking to rip out every dam. We were looking for balance. And so that, that you know, that always stuck with me as just sort of a watershed moment. And then, you know, fast forward a few years later, 
um, you know, we had to raise a lot of money and it was great to see the response of the donors. And we, we, uh, we met our goal of raising 12, $10 million in private money, which then allowed us to really attract a lot of federal funds. And so the private component of this project was, was amazing, both from my organization and other organizations, really everybody chipped in. Uh, and then, the, but then maybe the more personal moment was, um, so in Blackman Stream, which is a tributary that comes into the Penobscot above the VZ Dam. So in advance of, of taking out the VZ Dam, we started doing some restoration work in the tributaries and we had built a fishway in, in Blackman Stream. And uh, basically right around 2013, 14, about three years after building that fishway, we had about 10,000 alewives show up um, to uh, go through that fishway into Chimo Pond. And that what gave the first indication that things were happening. You know, we're, that, that if we opened the habitat, the fish would come, so to speak. You know, the, the fish would do the rest themselves. And so that 10,000 and the 50 to 100 in this stream, you can almost jump across. And so, you know, that just shows you the potential here. And those, those that was a really personal moment for me to see those first alewives come back. Thanks, Andy. Um, John or Laura, before I turn to a different subject matter, and I might add one of my favorite stories, but let me see if either of you have something you want to make sure we get in, a reflection of a favorite moment. I have a story that I'd like to tell about one of the aha moments that uh, really hit me personally. And that was right after the Great Works Dam came out, there was a group of folks that got organized to do a cleanup. You know, once the impoundment was lowered after the dam came out, there was a lot of debris exposed from the, uh, it was an industrial site and there was a lot of metal and glass and all kinds of things exposed along the shoreline. So uh, there was, uh, we organized a cleanup day and it was uh, the, the trust worked with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the town of Old Town to do a cleanup. So we met in the morning and we kind of divided up the area and we each chose an area to go to, to do our part of the cleanup. And I chose an area that I was told by our uh, tribal historians that it was an area that tribal members used to do a lot of hide tanning because of the, the water and the pools and everything. It just made a, a nice site to do some, some uh, hide tanning. So uh, I went down to that site and the first thing that I saw was an adult bald eagle that was hunting fish on these newly uh, recreated rips in the river. And that's, that's when it hit me. You know, it just, there was kind of almost like a spiritual moment where, um, you know, I realized that the ancestors of my people maybe knew the ancestors of this eagle. That, um, we've had a relationship for a very, very long time. And I think that eagle was thanking us for recreating those rips. So he or she had a, a new place to hunt and fish. That was a really aha moment. And that's when it really, it really hit me. John, I remember um, speaking of dam removal, Pete, you mentioned one of the, the aha moments for you. I had something similar. I believe it was at the, um, the photo you showed where it was at the VZ Dam removal and we were standing during a drumming circle. Um, and I think I was standing next to, you talked about Bucky, Pete. Uh, I think I might've been standing next to Roger Milliken, um, who is a great champion of the project as well. And I look, you know, I wasn't the only one. There was hundreds of us there and we started to look up and there was a circle of four eagles circling around the drumming circle. And, um, and then the paddler came up right with that shot that the, I think it was the New York Times got that photo you showed, John, it was such an amazing moment. Um, we're getting a ton of questions, team. So I'm gonna, um, Laura, go, you wanna add something? You about, no. Well, okay. uh, well, uh, I was I was just going to say that um, when when 
Um, you asked this question, so many uh, points in the project come into my mind, but one thing really characterizes all of them, which is there were so many people who gave to the project and stretched, whether that was uh, financially by making you know, uh, tremendous gifts in the beginning of the project that um, meant a lot because of um, the funding that was needed to do the project, but really uh, meant so much because of the confidence and support they gave for the possibility that we could do this tremendous thing to um, people who made fly rods and donated them, to folks who live near the river and were afraid of the change, but decided not to fight it and to um, kind of really take what we were trying to do for the public good and um, you know support that. And there are hundreds of those stories. So um, really my overwhelming feeling is how much of an experience it was about people coming together and really thinking about the common good and, um, and, and, su and supporting it, even giving it the benefit of the doubt. And without that, there's no way that this project could possibly have succeeded. Yeah, let's pick up on that. Um, and there's a question uh, in here that Ralph Tucker is asking, which is, you know, what, what lessons, when you're talking about the project now, what lessons do you share with others that inspire to do this kind of work here in Maine? Or else, Laura, I know you're involved in a lot of projects elsewhere in the country. TNC is involved in some projects around the world. But what, what do you think at, are an absolute necessity when even exploring this as a concept? Pete, go for it. Okay, very quickly. I mean, one lesson, um, which is a little bit different than ingredient, uh, which is a, another piece of that of that question. But one lesson we've learned here is that if you give nature a chance, it comes back with a vengeance. I think each of those stories that were shared uh, by Andy and John and Laura and myself um, demonstrated that um, how quickly nature is ready to repopulate um, habitat that has been inaccessible. We saw that with the Edwards Dam within weeks of removal of that dam in 1999, uh, people were catching stripers for the first time in 137 years up in Waterville. Um, and the, since the Edwards Dam was removed and the Fort Halifax Dam uh, was removed on, um, uh, on the Sebastocook, 37, 37 million alewives have returned uh, through the Benton Falls fish lift. So the, the lesson there is if you, it's the reverse of if you build it, <laughs> they will come. It's if you unbuild it, they will come. Um, and then very quickly on ingredients, what's essential. It's really about people. It's about relationships and connections and trust. And uh, that if you come up with a common vision, um, it's a, you know, with the right people as, as was mentioned by, uh, by Andy that, you know, Scott Hall was a critical person. You know, uh, the people on this webinar and the people watching it are, were critical people and collectively people can make a difference. Anyone wanna add to that? I, one, while you're thinking, um, just building on something that the rest of you had mentioned, uh, one thing that I was really impressed when the Nature Conservancy joined all of you to be a partner in the group um, is the amount of legwork you had all done with the communities um, to bring them along in, in the learning and the dialogue. Laura, you referenced this a, lot, a little bit. Um, but you also made sure that um, that work kept going on. Um, and for me, that was really important because my job on the team was to help raise the public dollars. And the fact that you had built so much community support from the get-go, I know, was a really key ingredient that sometimes gets overlooked. So, Andy, I'm going to ask yeah. you a question about fish. Um, Pete just mentioned Benton Falls and the restoration. There's, there's a question specific to salmon. But I would hope that you, which is, um, will this mean that salmon will recover? What are expected numbers? But I think maybe if you also address the other species that we hope that we're seeing recovery in. 
Sure. Well, you know, this project was always designed to, to benefit 11 species of sea run fish with Atlantic salmon being one of them. I think we always knew that this project would be a success for all these species. The most challenging one probably is Atlantic salmon because the numbers were so low. The fact that the Atlantic salmon go to Greenland and then come back and they've got a lot of problems in the ocean as well. But, you know, that being said, you know, we do think that this project, given the amount of habitat it has, and it's the only large functioning river now in the southern range of Atlantic salmon, is the best chance we have for saving Atlantic salmon from extinction in the U.S. And so the run in 2020, this was, it's going to be the fifth or sixth largest run in the last 30 years. And we're trending upwards over the last seven or eight years. And so is it completely due to this project? And, you know, probably not, but certainly I, I think it's related to this project. And then, and it, it mirrors these other populations where, you know, the river herring now and are, is up to about between allies and bluebacks are up to 3 million fish the last two or three years. And that number is going to jump as we do more projects upstream, which are, in, which are underway or, or have been completed. You know, uh, fish to watch is American shad. That number was 11,000 this year, up from probably under 1,000 just a decade ago. So we're starting to get to a point where we can see exponential increases in these numbers. Um, you know, others, but at the same time, you know, we've got to give it time. It hasn't been that long since we've opened up this river. Those species like eels, American sturgeon, short nose sturgeon, they don't get sexually mature until they're 12, 15, 20 years old. And so, you know, we're starting to build that stock as fish come back and are, are in, that, in that system, but it's going to take time for some of these species to see the response. Laura, John, anything you want to add to that part of the question? You're good. Okay. Another question, uh, Laura, go ahead. I know I'm not well, giving you I, I'm just, just in addition to kind of just the, the pure, you know, bi biological numbers of the fish, uh, there are so many um, stories that we've all heard or personally experienced since the dams came out. Um, and, you know, I, I remember getting a call from um, Scott Phillips, who's a Penobscot tribal member, and he lives up, up um, on uh, um, Pushaw Lake and young alewives uh, being just on the shoreline of where he lives and in numbers that he'd never seen before in his lifetime. So uh, it was, um, you know, getting those phone calls from people, people who would say, I'm at a place where uh, I've never seen salmon or I haven't seen them for, you know, 25 years and now I'm seeing them um, was uh, a, a really, uh, you know, just a, a really moving experience for a lot of people to realize that their children or their grandchildren were going to see a new live river um, in a way that they uh, had really lost in their own life, lifetimes. And it was a, a really moving part of being part of the project. So there's a couple questions in the Q&A um, about, you know, we're talking about the success of the project and um, Lori showed the map of the 2000 miles of um, habitat that's been opened or beginning to be opened. Would anyone like to take a first shot on what's next on, on your plates? Your, you, um, John, either as the nation, Pete as NRCM, so not necessarily as us as a trust, but each individual organization. And Laura, again, you work around the country, so there may be something you want to draw upon there. But John, why don't you kind of what next, what's on the Penobscot Nation's plate um, for you when you wake yeah. up every day? Well, thanks, you know, thanks for asking that. Um, yeah, there's additional relicensings going on now in the watershed. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the Mattacean Dam, which is critical. Uh, we have the, um, uh, the West Enfield Dam, which is just starting to go through the relicensing process. And then there'll be other relicensings coming up on the West Branch uh, within the next few years. So, uh, you know, the tribe will be engaging in those uh, intimately to try to get further improvements, uh, both in terms of flows and, and uh, protections for fish passage. So there's opportunities for folks to, you know, continue to uh, be engaged with uh, these ongoing relicensings through the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. 
Yeah, that's right. I, I would just say the project is really focused on the main stem of the river. We still have a legacy of problems in the tributaries, but because it's brought a lot of investment further upriver, and uh, our main headwaters project, we've now completed 29 different projects in up in the Penobscot, whether it's road crossings, building fishways in some places where appropriate, or removing other dams. And so uh, it's really because of this project that we've seen such an ongoing continued investment that's going to continue to pay dividends for decades up there. Let me just jump in quickly. So um, the state of Maine has about a thousand dams and just a little over a hundred of them uh, generate power. So we have a lot of dams in our, in our rivers and streams. We have thousands of culverts and um, Atlantic Salmon Federation and Trout Unlimited and the tribe and TNC have done an incredible job mapping out uh, which of these obstacles create the biggest harm and then systematically trying to um, engage with those communities and the, and the owners and the, the state and federal agencies to, to bring together the right mix of people and resources to, um, to repair. Uh, and it's important to try to think about, although we will never get back to what once existed in the state of Maine of more than 30,000 miles in rivers of rivers and stream that enabled sea run fish to go from the ocean deep into our north woods without obstacles of dams. We have a thousand dams and the ones that are causing the most harm are the ones that are low in the watershed that don't generate very much power, but do um, represent a wall that blocks fish from moving forward. We've come a long way in the last 20 years in opening up our thinking about uh, dams and, and that they're not permanent fixtures on the landscape. So we are starting to remove the ones that cause the most impact through the relicensing process, through collaborative efforts. Uh, and there's a lot of additional work to be done. So we encourage people who have helped uh, get these projects to move forward to to continue to engage with our organizations and others at the local level to, to try to let the fish get to where they want to go. It's good for all of us. Mm -hmm. And Laura, it's uh, Sean, our friend Sean Mahoney over at Conservation Law Foundation put in the chat that St. Croix and the Presumpscot are other examples of work that's going on. You want to re reflect on anything more nationally, Laura, that you've, the Penobscot has helped illustrate? Well, I'm involved in um, the Klamath River um, Renewal. I'm on the board of the Klamath River Renewal Corporation. And uh, that effort certainly had, uh, it certainly was inspired by, by the Penobscot project. And I, I think it's remarkable that since the Edwards Dam came out, and I, I live um, very close to the Kennebec River, uh, and the it is absolutely astonishing to watch um, how the river has come back. Main Rivers, uh, a state, statewide organization has been doing work up on the Sebastocook um, to continue to let um, uh, fish migrate uh, to the waters that they're trying to reach. And on the St. Croix, there's a tremendous opportunity. The alewife run on the St. Croix uh, was just um, absolutely, I mean, astonishing in the past. And there's a, a tremendous potential there. On the Klamath River, uh, the Penobscot project is a different, was a, obviously a different scale than a project that runs through, um, you know, Oregon and California, but it has all the ingredients that are needed. Uh, and it all really gets back to the people and uh, including the company that is involved in the project and uh, their willingness once an agreement's made to really work to make it happen. We had that here. Uh, and um, I, I think that it'd be interesting, and I know that there are people working on doing it, to know uh, what the real ripple effect of the Penobscot project and the Edwards Dam removal, um, for that matter, um, uh, have had uh, on river restoration throughout the world, because uh, not a week goes by that, that I don't receive an inquiry about, about it. So um, thanks to all of you who are continuing to do, the, do this good work. 
Lauren, I'll just point out that there's an organization that the Nature Conservancy is part of called the World Fish Migration Foundation. And really that um, came about by some of our folks here in Maine talking to some other folks across the Atlantic and beginning to see that there's such an amazing opportunity to share these lessons and also celebrate. Um, Andy, you talked about fish in um, Blackman Stream. You know, how often do we get to see a mass migration anymore? Um, and this is one of the places, Maine is so amazing in that we can see this kind of migration now again in our lifetimes. Um, we've talked about eagles, we talked about alewives. Um, but Andy and John, there's a really specific question that I want one of you, each of you to answer in one sentence each in your own way, okay? So Andy and John, how do the salmon no to come back to the Penobscot. So I want to see if you answer differently. <laughs> well, you know, certainly salmon have a very strong homing instinct. They, you know, they all sea run fish for the most part, except with the exception of eels, you know, even the herring are coming back to Blackman stream. So it's not just salmon, but salmon, you know, but different species have different strain rates. Salmon have a very strong affinity to the river, the tributary, and the, the riffle they were born in. And so, um, you know, it's it's a, a lot of people think it's a magnetic, and part of its magnetic draw that brings them back. Some, it's the scent of the water. Um, there's different things like that. But I don't think we fully understand, just like we fully don't understand why a salmon, Atlantic salmon, takes a fly when you happen to be fishing up in Canada these days. You know? All right, that was longer than a sentence, but John. Oh, <laughs> I just, I always just thought they were smart because they travel in schools. Yeah. Um, no, I think Andy, I think Andy uh, did a great job answering that question. I understand that they develop a homing instinct uh, when they're in this multiplication process and they chemically imprint to the, to the river of their, their natal origin. I was gonna see if anyone wanted. Um, the, uh, the other thing I th think would be, was a really interesting aspect of the project um, and we might not have time right now to get into detail about it, but um, one of the great things that the the trust did in partnership with our federal agencies and state agencies was create a um, monitoring protocol, which actually, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was the first comprehensive protocol that was set up on a restoration of like this. And what it's allowed us as a community to do is look really at this before and after impacts. We, we've, as you mentioned, Pete and Laura really all know and can see what's happening right now on the Kennebec after Edwards Dam came out 20 years ago. Um, but we created baselines. Were there other surprises there? I believe there was an, was it a sturgeon that we didn't, you showed some pictures of sturgeon, Laura, in the river that I think we didn't even know were there until the monitoring showed that. Is that right? And Molly yeah. Payne Wynn, I know you're out there. She'll probably <laughs> chat and answer. Yeah. And <laughs> Yes, it cer certainly we, we learned a lot about the populations of fish that were in the river and we had an opportunity because uh, we had some years to plan for the project to set up with the support of, um, the, uh, of, of NOAA um, and, the, uh, and working with the University of Maine and uh, a, a great group of scientists to set up a protocol um, so that we would have scientific um, evidence of, of um, the impacts of dam removal. And there are a few places where that, that has happened even to date. So I do think that that's a unique contribution um, that, that the Penobscot uh, made. I, I also think that, um, that we have tried to share, you know, stories that people have um, had personal stories with the river uh, anecdotal stories aren't science, but they're important. You know, they're an important part of um, 
people understanding what the fish coming back really means. You know, there are people who say, well, I'm not really a fish person. I don't fish. Well, it isn't really a project about the fish. It's a project about the life of the river and all the communities that are related to the river. And that's, that, that is, that's a universal um, element of place. It, um, you know, it can be a river, it can be a lake, it can be in the woods, but the relationship between people and um, wildlife and nature and having um, things um, come full circle and maintaining the integrity of those places is really important. And the same ingredients apply everywhere, really. And that's, I think, why the Penobscot Project um, has had a lot of universal um, applicability. And it's also why the work of, um, you know, I just want to mention that um, uh, Cheryl Daigle was our outreach coordinator and George Aponte Clark, um, the deputy director, and he worked on a lot of the implementation of the project. And um, I think that, I think that um, all of those, um, you know, no matter what any of us were working on on the project, we um, ran into those stories all the time. And part of the legacy of the project are opportunities like this that all of us who were involved have to share what those things were and how they, what they mean to other, other places. Just quick, very quickly on, on sturgeon. So um, sturgeon have played an important role in both the Kennebec and the Penobscot projects. Uh, there was, a, a, of course, a school of, of short-nosed sturgeon that were identified off of Bath Ironworks um, and uh, BIW um, as they were looking at expanding their landlocked um, uh, facility out into the river became partners in helping pay for the removal of the Edwards Dam uh, because they would have had an impact on uh, that, that um, population of, of sturgeon that I think were mostly wintering there. And now the, the sturgeon in the Kennebec is so um, remarkable that people line up in the Adirondack chairs in Hollowell during their lunch hour to watch them breaching. And it's amazing. And in the spring, seeing these um, prehistoric fish breach uh, is just such a, a, a wondrous thing that we can do. I'm in Augusta right now, it's, it's you know half a mile from here. I can go down and see sturgeon breaching. And we don't really know why they breach. And we don't really know why salmon come back. And that's what's so, wonderful about these projects is there's a lot about nature that we don't know and that's as it should be. Thanks Pete um, and there's some follow-up uh, comments in the chat that all the audience can I believe can see that helps get a little more data on sturgeon and the monitoring work. Thanks Josh and Molly. Um, we're going to be moving towards the ending of our of our time together. So I want the panelists to begin thinking of, um, I'm going to go to our lightning round in a minute, but there's this really great question um, in the, in the Q&A about how much the world has changed in the last really 19 years now of when the project began and where it is today. Um, so, you know, there was changes even during the project period and the 16 year project period. Is there anything that strikes you that, um, and I'm gonna answer this one first, that strikes you as, thank goodness we did that. You mentioned Cheryl and George and the outreach, Laura, but was there anything else you wanna just make sure the audience knows that you would say, thank goodness we did that. And one again, that I'll reflect on is I remember, Gosh, Lauren, Andy, and John, I can't remember the year, but we were down in Washington, D.C., having one of our many, many conversations with our phenomenal delegation who really supported this project. And it must have been around 2009, 2010, energy prices were going up. And the recognition of renewable energy as being such a crucial element um, to this project I remember we, we looked at each other and, and I think I said, thank goodness you negotiated with PPL to keep, to replace the power and figure out an approach that allowed for what it resulted in a net increase of power production on this project because had we not, we would have gotten really, I think we would have lost public support and by, by then extension, 
uh, political support on the project. Are there any other moments like that that you, any of you remember that you just want to make sure the audience hears about? One real quick, I'm, I'm so thankful that we, we thought big, uh, that we went into these discussions with, to try to achieve a macro settlement to deal with disputes that had been longstanding in the watershed with some big ideas. Um, and this came back to me when I was looking through the book and I saw this um, statement, a quote in the, in the book from Butch Phillips and it said, quote, the day John Banks told me about this project, I thought he was joking. I couldn't believe it. And um, that just speaks to, we were thinking big. And I think that's what really makes this project so significant. We opened up the main stem and we pushed the generation um, off the main stem to achieve the balance of power and the rebalancing of interests in the watershed. Yeah, and you know, related to that, you know, a lot of the fisheries restoration, the Penobscot had always been around Atlantic salmon, but we had, you know, that had limited stakeholders, limited funding. Related to what Pete said, by thinking big, thinking about a multi-species approach where the science was driving us anyway, uh, allowed us to really, you know, bring more people under the tent of, of restoration, whether it's politicians or NGOs or the public. And that, that made a big difference. And, you know, basically we're never going back. We're always gonna be multi-species restoration going forward. All right, I'm gonna to shift to lightning round. I'm gonna start with John, Laura, Pete and Andy, and then I'll say one closing word that's in the chat that I wanna repeat. Um, so quick, res very quick response for each of you. A lesson you've learned from the work of this project. I think um, I think one of the big lessons has to do with perseverance um, and stick to it in this. You know, it took us what two and a half or three years just to arrive at a conceptual agreement. And I think one of the reasons this project was successful is that we took the time that we needed to make sure that we had the right people at the table and to make sure we had every you know every entities. Uh, desires and interests accounted for, and that um, you know, as Scott Scott Hall used to say, uh, you know, we took the time that it needed, and we didn't rush it to get to yes. And you know, this project, uh, you know, we'll never be able to repeat it exactly because of the unique circumstances, both in time and space, that existed uh, at the time. Uh, but what we can learn from it is to uh, take whatever time is required to get to yes. And uh, that's what we did. And I think uh, I'd like to just say that another aspect of the project is the amount of hope it has given me and the tribe for the future. You know, that so many diverse interests can come together and pull this off really gives me a great deal of hope for the future. Thank you. Thanks, John. And shoot, maybe we should have just, sorry, <laughs> should have just ended with John. <laughs> what do you all think? Is that, um, I do want to read, and I know Todd, we're right at time. I do want to read this following on John. Um, John, Someone I suspect you know, Kyle said, it's a statement as a Penobscot Nation council member, I want to thank John Banks and the team um, for the, uh, the team at the trust for improving these lives, um, life waves of so many creatures, including us as one of those creatures. As a young man, I've seen the work to bring back the river in a way that I didn't know was possible. I'm ad-libbing a little there. But um, Andy and I and John are still on the board of the trust and Pete's colleague, Lisa Pullman. Um, so on behalf of the trust, um, I want to reiterate our thanks to Laura, to George, to Cheryl, to Jeff and Molly and many, many, many other staff members who were part of the Penobscot Trust. We're now back to a collection of volunteering as partners. Um, and we are so grateful for you all bringing us together 
And as John said about Laura, managing every single morning to wake up and think about this project and keeping it moving. Um, I think that's it for today. I do want to say, I agree, Pete, the book um, is wonderful. Peter Taylor grabbed these stories and told the chronological history of this project. And it was really important to us as a board to make sure that was documented so that researchers, students, and many, many others can see this story long after we're all doing, doing something else in the world. Um, thank you all for joining and it's great to see you. And why don't we all come off mute and say, Goodbye and thanks. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thanks, Thank everyone. You, thanks for joining. Thank Good to see you guys. Thanks, y'all.